I was 15 years old, my pastor invited me to participate in a talent contest for youth in our denomination in Northern California. It was a very big deal. And there were three categories, singing, worship leadership, and preaching. Well, okay, so I entered the preaching category. And they gave me an assignment. Uh, they limited me to five minutes because, you know, they had to listen to a bunch of guys preach and other people sing and other people lead worship and so forth. So anyway, I had five minutes and they gave me the theme, which was learning of Christ. Well, once I knew what my theme had to be, I based my talk on Jesus' words in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 in which he says, learn from me. Now, ever since that time, this passage has had special meaning to me as the one that gave me my start in a preaching ministry. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30 is dear to the heart of most Christians. It meets us as a fresh breeze from Christ in the dry land of our lives. Here, Jesus says, basically, I have a double dose of rest for you. In this passage, Jesus made two promises. He said, I will give you rest, in verse 28, and you will find rest, in verse 29. I believe these two different kinds, I believe these are two different kinds of spiritual rest. They're not the same thing. The first is the rest that Jesus gives, and the second is a rest that we find. So now, let's see if we can discover the difference between the two rests. And more than that, let's seek to enter both of them. So here's the first one. Jesus will give you rest in his salvation. <clears throat> Our passage begins with an invitation from Jesus in verse 28, Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus doesn't say, do something for me. Instead, he says, come to me and let me do something for you. Jesus is specific about where we must come. Come to me, he says. Coming to church is good, but that's not going to do the job that he's talking about here. Nor is salvation found in coming to a priest or a pastor. Unless we come to Jesus in simple faith, we will never receive his salvation rest. Somebody says, well, I'm willing to go to God the Father in faith. Isn't that enough? No, it isn't. That's like trying to go to second base without touching first base in a baseball game. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now notice who the people are whom Jesus addresses. He invites the weary and burdened to find rest in him. You and I are weary and burdened by our worries, our fears, our sorrows, our trials, our loneliness, and our responsibilities. Most of all, we carry the burden of our sins against a holy God. And this results in the burdens of guilt and shame Jesus carried these terrible burdens for us when he died on the cross, and now he offers us rest from them. For many of us, that's too good to be true. So we like to punish ourselves with guilt, hoping that eventually the burden of guilt we've heaped on ourselves and suffered from will make up for the sins we've committed and will arrive at rest. But it never works that way, does it? We're like the man who was staggering down the road with a heavy pack 
on his back, a load. And a man came along in a car and saw him and stopped and said, hey, fella, would you like a lift? The guy says, oh, yeah, I sure would. Thank you very much. So the guy gets in the passenger seat, and the driver starts the car going down the road again. And he looks over at the passenger, and he sees that the passenger still has the heavy load on his back. So the driver says, hey, fella, why don't you throw the load in the back seat? You don't have to carry that anymore. And he says, oh, no, I wouldn't do that. You're already carrying me. I don't want you to carry my load, too. I can't ask you to do that. Well, we laugh at that man, but we carry our own burdens of fear, worry, guilt, shame, and sin even after Jesus has begun to carry us and our burdens. A boy asked his mother if she'd like to hear him recite Matthew eleven twenty eight, which he had just memorized in Sunday school that morning. She said, sure, go ahead. So he started in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are burdened and weary, and I will do the rest. Well, the mother told her that her son, had ne she had never heard it like that before, but, but she liked it that way. So then, to receive the salvation rest, Jesus promises, we must simply come to him with all our burdens. A Sunday school teacher was trying to impress on her students with their need for Christ. So she asked a 10-year-old boy in her class, Timmy, would you say that you commit at least one sin every day in your thoughts and the words you say and the things you do? That's three sins total every day. Do you think you do that much? And Timmy said, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I do more than that. And then the teacher said, okay, well, that adds up to more than a thousand sins a year, and you're 10 years old. You're getting close to 10,000 unforgiven sins that you have uh, in your heart. And Timmy went home that day thinking about his 10,000 sins that needed God's forgiveness. It was more than he could count or imagine. Up to that point in his life, he didn't think of himself as particularly evil, but now he was, he was becoming burdened with the load of sin. And that Sunday afternoon, Jimmy knelt, uh, Timmy knelt at his bedside, thanked Jesus for dying for his sins, asked Jesus to forgive him, and found rest in the Savior. Horatius Bonar had a similar experience. Here's how he put it in his autobiographical hymn titled, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. It says, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. Now, our human nature resists that. We want to clean up our lives before we present them to Christ. But that's like an overweight person who refuses to attend Weight Watchers until he loses 40 pounds so he'll look good enough or a terminally ill person who says, I'll go to the doctor when my condition begins to improve. No, Jesus invites us to come to him now, sins and all, even if we don't feel ready. Now, many of you know Tom and Pam Espino, members of our church. Uh, when I was a brand new pastor in this church, Pam was coming, Tom was not. And I was, you know, and the church was very, very small too, people-wise. 
And so I was going around, you know, visiting everybody in their homes. And I went to the Espino home, you know, basically to visit with Pam, really. And there was her husband, Tom. And I found him very willing to talk about spiritual things, though he had never accepted Christ as his savior. And after several visits with him, I got the impression that he was playing games with me. I had given him every reason I could think of that he should become a Christian. And he even agreed with me uh, about them. But he kept saying, I'm just not ready. Finally, I replied, Tom, you know that giving your life to Christ is the right thing to do, right? Yes, he admitted with a nod. But you don't feel ready? No, I don't, he responded. But since you understand it's the right thing, why don't you do it anyway? Why not let your mind overrule your feelings and so prevent yourself from making a mistake? God used that appeal to bring Tom to his commitment of faith. With a bit of fear and trembling, he said to me, You're right. Okay, I'll accept Christ into my life. We prayed together there in his living room with his wife, Pam, alongside him. Tom found rest in Jesus' salvation. He soon let me baptize him, and then he united with our church in membership. <clears throat> Show me a person who is looking for wholeness apart from Jesus Christ, and I'll show you a restless person. As Augustine said about 15 centuries ago, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Jesus wants to give us rest from the guilt of sin, rest from the power of sin, rest from the fear of death and judgment, and rest in our conscience. <clears throat> we don't deserve this gift, but gifts are never earned. Salvation rest isn't something we attain, but obtain. We don't achieve it, we receive it. Instead of asking, what have you got to give me? Jesus promises, I will give you rest. All we have to do is come to him in faith as burdened people. John Neal wrote a hymn based on this theme of the rest Jesus gives us. Let me read you the lyrics of this hymn. Are you weary, heavy laden? Are you sore distressed? Come to me, says he, and coming, be at rest. Has he marks to lead me to him, if he be my guide? In his feet and hands are wound prints and his side. Finding, following, keeping, struggling, is he sure to bless? Saints, apostles, prophets, martyrs answer, Yes. <clears throat> so there's my first point. Now for the double dose of rest. Point number two. <clears throat> you will find rest in Jesus' service. So we're going to look now at the second rest in this passage. A moment after promising to give us rest, Jesus said in the next verse, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, you will find rest for your souls. The Greek, the Greek word translated find is the same one Archimedes used when he said his famous line, Eureka! And Eureka in Greek means I have found. And then to complete the sentence, it would be I have found it. Uh, and that's what the ancient Greek scholar Archimedes shouted when he was in a bathtub and noticed that when his body went into the bathtub, the water level rose. He discovered the principle of displacement 
And when he discovered that, he shouted, Eureka! I have found it. And guess what? The motto of our state, California, is Eureka. I have found it. Now, every Christian should be able to shout with Archimedes, Eureka! Which means, I have found it. Don't forget that the rest we find is different from the rest Jesus gives in the previous verse. Charles Wesley understood that when he wrote in his hymn, in, in the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, he wrote this, Breathe, O oh breathe, thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit. Let us find that second rest. Earlier in this verse, Jesus told us how to find this rest. He said, take my yoke upon you, verse 29. A yoke is a symbol of service, so the rest we find comes from serving Christ. I didn't just guess at that. It's suggested in the passage. This rest follows the rest Jesus gives us in salvation in the previous verse. And this is the way our Lord always operates. First, Jesus holds his arms open wide and says to us, come to me. And then when we do come to him, he says, now go out into that world and share the gospel with them. <clears throat> Service always follows salvation. Sadly, many people try to reverse this order. They try to do great things for God in an attempt to earn their salvation. But that never works. First, we come to Christ and let Christ give us rest. Then we submit to his yoke, which is the symbol of our service to him and his authority over us. And only then can we begin to make a difference for Christ because that's when we find rest in serving Christ. Think of an ox under the yoke of a farmer. Uh, it means the animal is under the farmer's control. In Acts 15.10, Peter mentioned the yoke of the law and said that the Jewish people had been unable to bear it because they couldn't live up to its demands. It was too cruel of a master. So now Jesus comes along and says, take my yoke upon you and you will find rest. I imagine you'd all agree with me, I hope you all agree with me, that there's just something in our human nature that finds great rest in serving. And I think that's a part of the image of God in which he created us. We can't be satisfied lying out in the sun all day like a lazy dog. Here is Elizabeth Elliot's book titled Through Gates of Splendor, talking about how her husband, Jim Elliot, and four other young men, missionaries, basically the same age, they were all in their early 20s. And they went down to Ecuador as missionaries to the Aka Indians. Well, it turns out that just about as soon as they got there, the Aka Indians made human shish kebab out of all five men. They all died on January the, the 8th, 1956. And this book tells the, the story about it. Now, at the beginning of the book, as the five missionaries are, they're in a rowboat coming into the, you know, the village where the Aka Indians are, and, and they're singing this song. Listen to this. Uh, we rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle, thine shall be the praise. When passing through the gates of pearly, pearly splendor, 
victors, we rest with thee through endless days. Notice how they spoke of rest twice. Uh, resting on him as our shield and our defender, that's like resting in your salvation. But then uh, when passing through the gates of pearly splendor, we rest with him through endless days. Well, anyway, they, they sang that song, about, and that's where Elizabeth Elliot gets the title of her book, Through Gates of Splendor. So, <clears throat> anyway. Okay, now, many of you know Richard and Peggy James. Very sadly for us, they moved to the coast, but here's, here's a story about them for you. Maybe, maybe I've probably told it before. But anyway, when Richard and Peggy first started coming into the church, they soon decided to unite with us in membership, and they came to see me in my office. Pastor, they said, we want you to know that we want to do far more than just sit in a pew on Sunday morning and listen to a sermon and, and sing worship songs. We want to serve Jesus here. Well, boy, that was music to my ears. And for years, Richard and Peggy did exactly that. They served generously, lovingly, and faithful. Uh, and in so doing, they enjoyed the rest Jesus promised to people who take his yoke on their shoulders. I heard about a young man, a groom in the wedding. And when the wedding ceremony was over, he whispered to the pastor, is this the end? And the pastor said, no, son, this is only the beginning. <laughs> if the wedding is the end, it's the front end. And becoming a Christian is like that. It's just the beginning of a life of service to Christ. So then I ask each of you, can you put your finger on some task you're involved in and say, this is how I'm serving Jesus? Now, years ago here in our church, our children's pastor at that time was Robin Tucker, and she identified 176 jobs we needed to fill in children's ministry alone, okay? Like, for example, maybe we needed four people in the nursery at every Sunday at 9 a.m. and two more people in the nursery at 10.45 on the Sunday. Well, that's six jobs, okay? And then all the Awana jobs and the vacation Bible school jobs and, and uh, what all the other jobs. She counted 176 positions we needed to fill with volunteers in our children's department. And that's only from birth through sixth grade. Well, okay, maybe you can teach a Bible study, train a new believer to be a disciple, change diapers in the church nursery, listen to children recite their verses in our children's ministry, drive teenagers to camp, witness to a non-Christian friend. And these are just a sampling of countless ways to serve Christ. And a Christian can find rest in every single one of them. Now let me read to you what Charles Spurgeon said about rest. I love this quote. As long as there is breath in our bodies, let us serve Christ. As long as we can think, as long as we can speak, as long as we can work, let us serve him. Let us even serve him with our last gasp. And if it be possible, let us try to set some work going that will glorify him when we are dead and gone. Let us scatter some seed that may spring up when we are sleeping in the cemetery. Isn't that good? By the way, speaking of Spurgeon sleeping in the cemetery, Mary and I visited his grave when we went to London in 2003. 
And we stood right there on his, and I said to Mary, well, this is the closest I'll ever get to Charles Spurgeon on earth here. And uh, so anyway, that, that was exciting. God honored that desire in Spurgeon's heart about serving Christ after he's dead and gone. He's been sleeping in the cemetery since 1892, but about 100 of his books are still being published and blessing people. Spurgeon found the rest of serving under Jesus' yoke just as Jesus promised. But there's more. Jesus went on to say in verse 29, and learn from me. Learning is part of our serving. The more we learn about Christ, the easier it will be for us to bend our necks to his yoke. <clears throat> now, just maybe, <clears throat> you're not learning from Christ. One reason we stop learning is fear. We learn from new experiences, but we're afraid of them, afraid they will hurt us. And Jesus anticipates our fear when he goes on to say, for I am gentle. Because Jesus is gentle, he'll protect us from the things we fear. Jesus added, still in verse 29, and I am humble in heart. This is the only verse in the Bible that specifically mentions the heart of Christ. And because he's humble in heart, we can count on him to be patient and compassionate as we learn from him. Jesus proved he is humble in heart when he left heaven's throne to become a man. At birth, he was placed in an animal's feeding box. That's what a manger is. In life, he reached out to lepers and blind beggars. In death, he was crucified between two thieves. After his resurrection, Jesus didn't go back to Pilate and Herod saying, Now do you believe that I'm the Messiah? He never showed himself off to anyone. He was humble in heart. When they crucified Jesus in public, he didn't say, I've never been so humiliated in all my life. And the reason he didn't say that was that he had already humbled himself himself. And isn't that the kind of Lord you'd like to learn from? The primary way we learn from Jesus is by digging into scripture. The Bible is our only inspired authority on Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, character, words, and plan for our lives. <clears throat> One night, I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, not at all unusual for me. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, I, I can't get back to sleep. But anyway, so I began worrying about silly little details in my life. After worrying for about laying awake for lying awake for about half an hour, I got up and started having my devotions, which I usually do first thing in the morning when I get up. But here it was, you know, 2.30 in the morning, and so I was reading my Bible, and I was reading in Luke 10, and I came across verse 20, where Jesus told his disciples, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I, after reading that, I went back to bed and told myself, what am I so worried about? My name is written in heaven. Thank you, Lord. And very soon after that, I was asleep again. I was resting in the promise I had learned from Jesus. And I know you can rest in Jesus' promises too. In our passage, our Lord gave us one more incentive to serve him. He said in verse 30 now, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke, of course, you know what that is, a level piece of wood fastened to the necks of oxen that are pulling a plow. At first glance, it may look like the yoke of Jesus is going to be a burden to us. Um, 
But for the ox, the yoke is the opposite of a burden. The yoke makes the oxes work light. If the ox had to pull the plow without a yoke, its work would be intolerable. The yoke makes the ox work easy. Not only that, but Jesus implies that we're in the yoke together with him because he calls it my yoke. So we have a relationship with Jesus in our Christian service. It's not just service for him, but also service with him. Now he says, my yoke is easy. And the Greek word translated easy means easy to wear. The Living Bible picks up on that and renders it, my yoke fits perfectly. I, I love that translation. Now, in his vocation as a carpenter, Jesus made many yokes. He knew how to make them smooth so they wouldn't gall the neck of the ox. And just maybe the sign over his carpenter shop even read, my yokes are easy to wear or my yokes fit well. Well, if Jesus would be careful in his craftsmanship for an ox, you can count on him to craft an, a yoke that is tailor-made for your life. He knows that your spiritual neck is unlike anyone else's. And so he makes a personal yoke just for you. And once you put on his tailor-made yoke, your burden becomes light. The yoke we carried before we came to Christ chafed our necks. But the yoke we wear as Christians fits us to a T. Before we came to Christ, we were like Atlas, carrying the world on our shoulders, barely able to stand on his feet under his back-breaking burden. In the same way, the burden of sin was crushing us. But now that we're in Christ, our, yoke, our, our burden is light. A Sunday school teacher read this passage that I'm dealing with here tonight to her uh, class. And she said to the children, can anybody tell us what a yoke is? There was silence in the classroom. Finally, a little girl raised her hand and said, uh, that's something they put around the necks of animals. Teacher said, that, that's right. Now, can anyone tell us what the yoke of Jesus is? And there was silence in the classroom. And then that same little girl raised her hand. Yes. And she said, that's when Jesus puts his arms around your neck. <clears throat> I love it when Jesus puts his arms around my neck. I love to be in the yoke with him, serving him. Well, we've seen now that the double dose of rest Jesus has for us is, first of all, a rest from the burden of sin, and second, rest in the service of Christ. Now I'm going to appeal to you in my action steps to uh, invite you to do two things about this. First, ask yourself, what do I know of the double dose Jesus offers? Are you resting in his salvation? And are you resting in his service? Now, we'd fall short of God's purpose if we simply studied these two promises of our Lord and understood them. We must also trust Jesus to fulfill them in our lives. If you've never made Jesus your personal savior from sin, trust him for that now, and he'll give you a spiritual rest you've never known before. And if uh, you've never found the rest that comes from serving Christ, dare to serve him. And you'll be so excited about finding that rest that you'll feel like shouting, Eureka! 
Now for the second thing I'd like to say to you. Pray that God will use you to bring others into Jesus' twofold rest. Some people you know don't know Jesus. They're carrying a soul-crushing burden of sin. Invite them then to come to Jesus and receive his promised rest from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. Some other people you know are believers in Christ, but they aren't servants of Christ. Show them by your example the spiritual rest they can find in serving Christ. Encourage them to enjoy living in the image of God in which he created them. Jesus still says to you, me, and everyone in the world, I have a double dose of rest for you. I will give you rest in my salvation, and you will find rest in my service. I don't want to miss out on either of those rests, and I'm sure you don't either want to miss it, miss them. So, Father, we thank you that the rest in Jesus is so attractive and so fulfilling, resting in his salvation, resting in his service. Lord, help us not to miss out on either form of rest and help us to be burdened for people we know and love and even people we don't know at all who are strangers to these two rests that come in Jesus. Help us to be brave to share the gospel with people like that. And help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit when he gives us opportunities to do that. Thank you for our time together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.